Good evening, everyone. Good to be back with you tonight, especially since tonight I was able to actually get a shower before coming up, so I feel a little better. And um, had a nice time playing basketball with the young men today, but they, they play basketball like they play soccer, so they knocked me over a couple times, tackled me. So, but um, I think I'll be okay. I'll just take some Motrin or something so when I get in the room. Had a good time with the young men today. It's good to socialize and get to know everybody on different levels. And so we, it was nice to spend time with them today. Saw a good friend of mine, Pastor Hush, come in, um, who's brought me here. I, I brag in America that I, I once slept in a castle in England. And it was because of that man. And uh, I really enjoyed our time together. And he's looking great. So I, I appreciate seeing him tonight. Let's get right into God's word. We're going to finish the second part of this talk. Tomorrow night, we are going to deal with how to know God's will for your life. It's one of my favorite sermons I preach. Um, I've got it updated. There's some new stuff in it. So I'm going to talk about that tomorrow night because for your age group, a lot of times that's really where you are. Um, some people get that confused. They think I'm trying to give you God's will. Really, it's a decision-making tool based on the great uh, English Christian, George Mueller, and uh, one of our Adventist pastors in California, Morris Venden, a book that Morris Venden wrote, taking what Mueller had written. So tomorrow night, look forward to that. It's very practical. I'll tell you this week, I'm going to try and come in a practical manner for you guys. So tomorrow night, that's it. On Thursday night, we're going to talk um, on the stress equation, the stress equation. You don't want to miss that on how to deal with stress, where stress comes from, and a spiritual approach to it. Because you're move, transitioning into stages of life where mommy and daddy are no longer going to be doing everything. For some of you, they're not doing anything now. Um, and you've got to really be able to absorb life stresses as a Christian. Um, and there's a health reason to be able to do that. Um, but there's also a practical spiritual reasons why we need to be able to do that. So those are the next two nights. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys then. If you have your Bibles, the, the, the verses will be on the screen. But if you have your Bible, uh, feel free to turn to 1 Samuel 17. We're going to do a little re recap from last night first. 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting at verse 4. We read this last night. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Our message tonight, Facing Your Giants, Part 2. Facing Your Giants, Part 2. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to look at your truths. I ask now, Lord, that I would not be seen or heard tonight. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. As our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. So let's go through the, five, the six steps I gave you last night, six steps to facing your giants. Number one, be about your father's business. The Bible says that David was given, a, a given something to do by his father, and he was delivering the goods to his brothers when he went to the battle. It was an important biblical scene because David had just been anointed king by Samuel. He was the last of Jesse's sons, and Saul had had all of that removed from him. In order, you got to get this, when you read the Bible, it's big. In order for David to truly be viewed as king, there had to be a tangible kind of manifestation of his leadership skills and of his anointing. His going to deliver what his father wanted to and a message to his brothers was the venue through which God led him. Sometimes God sends you somewhere and it seems like it is trifling work. But some of the greatest things will happen in your life because you obey God in the little things. 
Be about your father's business. Number two, see fear as your first enemy. See fear as your first enemy. Sometimes we are so afraid of what's going to happen that we don't do anything. And you can't be like that. You have to literally be willing to step out in faith and face the giant because fear will paralyze you. In fact, there are many Christians who never do anything great. They never sign up to be a, um, a student at peace. They, they never uh, go, go pass out glow tracks. I listen to all the great word that was just said. They never do anything because they suffer from the paralysis of analysis. They're so afraid of what might happen and what might not happen that they actually never take the step God wants them to take. See fear as your first enemy. The giant is not as big as he seems. Third, know what you're fighting for. David asked him, what is that person given? And I didn't get to it last night, but the answer was, of course, that he would get the king's daughter, meaning he would become royalty. And there was all these prizes that he was get, would get, and his father would never have debt again in Israel. David knew what he was fighting for. We should know what we're fighting for. The passages in the scripture on the new Jerusalem and heaven are there for a reason. Did you get that? Everything in the Bible is there for a reason. And God puts these descriptions of heaven and of the new Jerusalem and all of the great things that he has prepared for us because God is a fear God. He wants you to know there is a reward at the end. Now, if you only think, you're, if you're only following God for the reward, you have a tough time. But God is fair. Know what you're fighting for. Know what's at stake. The fourth one is to bring your giant down to size. David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should speak against the armies of God? Bring a giant down to size. Sometimes we let our problems or what we're going to face seem so big that it causes our heart rate to increase and our pupils to dilate at just the thought of them. I challenge you that your giants are nowhere near as big as you think they are. Because you have God's covenant. We talked about that last night. And the giant is uncircumcised. It is not in covenant relationship with God. Beware of the enemy on your side. Let me tell you, some of the most discouraging words I've ever heard came from people who claim to love me. Some who are church, fellow church members, some who are family members, Beware the enemy on your side. David's brother was the one who was mocking him and trying to discourage him from doing what God wanted him to do. Why? Because I told you last night, because misery loves company. And the brother, his eldest brother, had been skipped over in being anointed as king. So he didn't want David to do anything great. Let me tell you something. You know how many of my friends, because of the company they keep, have landed themselves in prison? People like for you to mess up. You go away to college and come back to some of the neighborhoods I lived in, and you go back, the people in the old neighborhood like if you are messed up and you wind up stuck in the neighborhood with them. Beware the enemy on your side. And the sixth one was, don't just see your obstacles, see your opportunities. Don't just see your obstacles, see your opportunities and your advantages. And this one was because Goliath was so heavily weighed down that when David saw him, he saw someone who was immobile. He saw someone who was not uh, able to respond to a challenge quickly. He saw that the giant was so overconfident that the giant had inherent weaknesses that he could exploit. Don't just see your obstacles. In every challenge God puts in front of you, there's opportunity for something greater to happen. So don't just see the, op the obstacles, also see your opportunity. So we'll go back to the scripture. The last one we read, I think, yesterday was just about here. And it said, and David said, what have I now done? This is in response to his brother. Is there not a cause? Isn't there something that we should be fighting for? He responds to his brother. And in verse 30, the Bible says, and he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And the words which were heard were heard, which David spake. They rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. So now when, 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 when David is, t is talking and saying, wait a minute, why are we so afraid of this giant? I, I'll fight the giant. The people hear it and they go and tell Saul. 
When Saul hears that there's someone who's willing to fight the giant, he quickly calls him. Maybe this guy will get us out of this mess, but, but, but let me see what he looks like. David gets to Saul, and, and David says to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Don't let anybody be afraid because of this giant. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, come on, man, you, you're crazy? You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him? You're just a youth. And he's been fighting since he was a youth. You, you, you're too young to do what you think you're about to do. He challenged him because of his youth. And I submit to you that many of you go to churches where you may be challenged because of your youth. David said to Saul, your servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him and smote him. And delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, he likes calling this man uncircumcised. This uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion... And out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Phil this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with you. Now you got to get this. Saul is in trouble. He's the king, and he's not fighting the giant. Somebody's got to fight this giant. Saul hears David's confidence, and Saul has had experience with David. David played the harp and so forth. He, it, there's a little confusion that, David, that Saul doesn't seem to remember David, but David played the harp for him. He, he had some experience with him. But David doesn't go back to the palace on Saul. He doesn't say, don't you remember me? I played the harp for you and, 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 and played out the demon out of you. But don't you remember that I did that? David says, you know, I can fight this giant because I beat a bear and I beat a lion. Which brings us to the seventh step in facing your giants. You must remember your victories. Now watch this. So God gives you little victories, little victories, little victories, so that one day you can face your giant victory. The little victories will come in your life as you submit to God. You'll give up little things, uh, little challenges, little, little, little quirks in your character will, will be smoothed out. And you, you'll see how God changes you over time You're, as, as the work of sanctification by the Holy Spirit happens. And all of it is, is a testing ground. You've got to remember how God has led you. So one of the things I advise people to do is to keep a prayer journal. And when something is happening in your life that is difficult and challenging, write out your prayer request to God. There's two reasons to do that. One of them is, you, and, and they talk about this when they talk about uh, good sleep hygiene and the importance of sleep. When you do that, if you write that out before you go to bed, you can fold up, you can close up the book, put it in a drawer, and shut it. And that should symbolize to you that the, the problem is put to bed so that you can sleep. Practical. But the other reason is, and I've done this myself, you go back and look in your prayer journal from a year ago or five years ago, and you're amazed at what was seemingly so daunting when the problem was in front of you. How am I going to pay my tuition? How am I going to pass this test? How am I going to get through this class? How am I going to deal with the fact that this person broke my heart? How am I going to deal with these problems? And you look back and you realize, boy, the best thing ever happened was that fool left my life. Prayer answered. <laughs> Remember your victories. They're valuable. And David does that. When he has to challenge Goliath, he thinks to himself, all by myself out there mining sheep, a bear came. Do you have bears in England? They have a lot of them in America. And they, and they come down into people's neighborhoods. And they're They're big. And they're strong and they're and they're and they're deceptively fast. David said, listen, the bear came for the sheep and I killed the bear. A lion came and I killed the lion. And guess what? The God who gave me victory over those two foes will give me victory over this one. 
Don't forget how God has given you victory in the past. Don't forget where God has brought you from. Don't forget who you used to be sometimes. And we don't like to live in our past, but don't forget that God has moved you to a new place. In fact, the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White says it like this. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. You don't have anything to fear if you trust God. You can fight any battle that comes in front of you if you remember that God has your back. So the story goes on in verse 38. The Bible says, And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go. He was about to walk out, for he had not proved it. David said, I can't do it. David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David took off Saul's armor. Now, I read a, a, an essay on this once, and, and, and the writer says that there may, the, one of the reasons Saul may have wanted to do this, remember, yesterday we talked about the armies being on two separate mountains. Remember that? If David puts on Saul's royal armor and walks down into the valley, a lot of people would think it was Saul who walked down there. See, Saul was trying to do what we call this in the States. We say, Saul was trying to pull an okie doke on folk. If David walks down there and Saul, it, it might look from the mountaintop like Saul was going to fight. Now watch this. If David wins in Saul's armor, there would be those. I mean, they don't have Twitter. Nobody would tweet who won. And, you know, they, they, they would think Saul won the battle. And then on the flip side of it, on the flip side of it, if he goes down there and he's beaten and murdered and killed, at least Saul wasn't in the armor. But David puts him on. He said, man, you know, I can't. This thing doesn't ride right on me. It doesn't fit right. That big, heavy sword. In fact, if I put on Saul's, you even think of David as a warrior now. If I put on Saul's armor, I lose the one tactical advantage I have that I'm more nimble, that I'm more quick, that I can respond, that I can strike first. And David takes it off, and it leads to our eighth point in facing your giant. You cannot fight as someone else. Let me tell you something. I have a, uh, my grandmother who passed away a few years ago. Her name was Olga. Olga, and my grandmother's, her, her married name was Clark. But she was in, uh, born a Bernard in, in, in a town called uh, Bethel Town in uh, Westmoreland, Jamaica. Now, Olga was something else. When my grandmother prayed, I want you to hear this, she prayed and it was literally as if God stopped what he was doing to respond. She would pray, and, and my mother says that when they were growing up in Kingston, uh, my grandmother would start to pray. And she prayed so long that they could sneak out of the house, go downtown and shop and come back and find their space. And she'd stop praying and it'd be as if they never left. My, my grandmother tells great stories of how the Obia women, the, which is uh, the Jamaican word, the Patwa word for, for voodoo. The Obia women would, would, would try to put spells on her and, and there's stories of how at nights they would be in the house and they would begin to hear uh, horses running around the house and when they looked out the window, there were no horses running. My, my mother and my Aunt Doreen co uh, corroborate the story and say that, that one night they, they could hear these horses and they didn't see them and then when they looked uh, out the window, they couldn't see them and then they, they heard the horses running above the house. And my grandfather was a truck driver in Jamaica and he was gone and my grandmother took all seven of the kids and put them on the ground and they all prayed the night away and then, and then finally the horse hoofs stopped their pounding around the house. The next morning, my grandmother, and every Sabbath afternoon, that's what we did. We sat and she told us these stories. And she, my grandmother says that the next morning, a woman came frantically running over to her as she was putting clothes out on the line and said, Mrs., uh, what kind of woman are you working? My grandmother said, I'm not working any obia. I serve Jehovah God. But watch this. I, as powerful 
and as faithful as my grandmother is. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, it talks about Timothy. Paul says that Timothy had a legacy of faith from Eunice, his grandmother, and Lois, his mother. There was a, there was a legacy of faith. I have that legacy of faith, but watch this. I can't fight in my grandmother's armor. As Christian as she was, and let me tell you something, some of you come from some powerfully Christian homes. And, and it's comfortable because you figure somebody's always praying and someone's connected to God. But I'm here to tell you, you've got to get your own armor. Instead of taking his armor, verse 40 says, and he took a staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. Now you might say he took five stones because David wasn't sure if he'd hit the Philistine on the first shot. But the reality is that Goliath had four brothers. David had enough stones for each one of the brothers. And leads us to our ninth point. Be prepared. Be prepared. The great U.S. President Benjamin Franklin who dons the $100 bill, he said this, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Be prepared. In fact, the apostle Peter says it like this, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready when? Now there's two, two levels of this I want to hit you with about being prepared. The first one is a practical everyday life one. There really is no such thing as luck. Uh, there's, there's coincidence. But a lot of times, wow, that person is so lucky they got that job. That singer is so lucky they got that singing contract. That, that athlete so lucky he signed a million, so many million dollar contract. Let me tell you something. What we often call luck is the combination of opportunity meeting preparation. That's what it is. And I challenge you in your daily, so as students, as you enter the workforce, I challenge you. You know, they, one, of, one, of my, um, one of my senior residents when I, was, when I was in medical school at the University of Miami, Kendrick, he was from the U.S. Virgin Islands, and he, he gave me the, one of the best pieces of advice. He said, if you want to get through this thing and you want to be the best doctor possible, he said, you need to be the first one to the hospital every morning and the last one to leave every night. And when you're in training, that's important. Because you want, when the time comes, to be prepared. Now, there's another level I want. That's the, that's the career academic level. But then there's a spiritual level. There's a Jesus is coming back soon level. And, and we each must be prepared. Let me tell you something. When I look at the world now, at what's going on, there is no doubt the things that are going on in the world even in, our, even in the most far-fetched prophetic diagrams of the 70s and 80s, no one would have ever even begun to believe the stuff that's happening now would be happening culturally and morally. It would have been unheard of. I mean, people couldn't even think some of what's going on now could happen. And let me challenge you that if you think that we are just uh, kind of floating along through time and there is no great uh, climax in time that is about to happen, I challenge you that you are so wrong. Yes. <laughs> you see, Jesus really is coming soon. There's no way around. In fact, the longer you live and, the, and, the, and as you see the condition of the world get grimier and more complicated and more diseased, you start to breathe out under your breath as you listen to the evening news. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And some of you that have been in the faith a while, you, you're just praying that Jesus would end this thing and, and take us home. But guess what? You can't pray that prayer unprepared. David was prepared. You see, while his brothers were, were getting the advantage, while they were living a better life, David was the youngest one who was relegated to watch sheep. Now, David, <laughs> David could have been so angry at the task of watching sheep that while he was out there, he didn't prepare himself. I want you to get this. 
But you see, when David was watching the sheep, he was learning patience. He mastered playing the harp out there by himself. So that when the opportunity met his preparation, he was able to sit in the palace. You know how much good it did David later on as king that he had experience in the palace as a child? You see, he didn't come from a royal family, so he had no experience in how the palace worked. God used his harp playing to allow him to learn the politics of the palace of Jerusalem. And while he was watching the sheep, he wasn't just learning how to play harp. David was mastering the skill of using a slingshot. It wasn't a big windup. A lot of experts say it was just a quick whip and throw. And, the, and he could, the velocities which he could reach with a smooth stone. That's why the stone is described as smooth. It's physics. The, the smoother the stone, the less friction as it passes through the air, the faster it travels. And while David was watching those sheep, he was out there practicing with his sling and getting his aim down. That's why David didn't pick up 25 stones to try and hit one giant. He picked up five stones to hit five giants. You get that? He was prepared. And (laughs) he prepared when there was no audience. He prepared when no one was looking. Preparation doesn't really do well in front of a crowd. The greatest of all basketball players are great because they're shooting shots when the arena is empty. The Christian who is most in line and who is most fed and the one who is best prepared to fight the wiles of the enemy is the one who is studying his word and preaching his sermons when there is no congregation. Preparation. The time you spend with God in the morning, in the evening. And I I, I try to build the thing into my life. I try to use technology to my advantage because some of of it is so foul. So I have all kinds of different things that are emailed to me every day that I have to read. I I went on Tozer on Christian leadership and I have uh, different verses of the day. And I have uh, people who send me two or three different preachers post for the day. And by just going, just reading those emails every day, at least I, every day I get a little bit of preparation. Somebody say, man, I, what would that make a good sermon? I challenge you ha, to build preparation into your lifestyle. I challenge you to make Bible study and prayer a default in your life. I challenge you that when you're in the shower, that you say you take time even in the shower as you as you physically wash away the stain of dirt, that you don't shower without praying for the blood of Jesus Christ to spiritually wash away the stain of sin. We're going to talk more about the brain and its function maybe on the night when we talk about stress. But we now know that habits happen for a reason. They're formed for a reason. God designed us so that in a a part of our brain, we we actually change the anatomy of the brain, the neuroanatomy of the brain, digging deeper and deeper grooves into the brain, as Ellen White described long before the neurologists did. And these habits, when they're formed, become second nature behavior challenge you to be so prepared that it's instinct, it's reflex to do what God wants you to do. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always. Scripture says, and the Philistine came and drew near unto David. As David charges toward Goliath, Goliath thinks he can handle him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. He was upset, he says, because of David's young age. He was upset. He was ruddy and of a fair countenance. And uh, Goliath looks at him and says, this guy isn't even finished growing up. He's not even an adult. And they send him to fight me. The Philistine said unto David, am I a dog that you come to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. As the battle is about to take place, as the challenge is about to happen, the enemy rises up and he begins to get even more mouthy than he was before. He curses David. The Philistine said to David, come to me. I'll give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air 
and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Then David says, wait a minute, let me just, let me just tell him the whole story. You see, you see, this day will the Lord deliver you into my hand and I will smite you and take your head off of you. Mercy. And I will give your carcass of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a what? Do you see why David did what he did? David could not allow this giant, this, this uncircumcised Philistine to speak this way about God because there was a spectacle. There were people watching. <laughs> Y'all missing this thing. Y'all missing this thing. You see, David wasn't going to defend Saul. He wasn't even as interested, I don't believe, in simply winning a war. David had to set precedence if he was going to be king of Israel. That he served the one true living God. And he wanted it to happen so that when everybody ran from the battlefield that day and went home, they all went home and said, Israel's God prevailed. You see, if Israel had just set down another giant and beat Goliath, God wouldn't have gotten any credit. You see, the reason there is such a, a, a differential between this, your size and the size of your problem sometimes is because if God made it a fair fight and you won, you'd think you won. So God gives you giant problems, big challenges, and huge tasks, mountains to move, and battles to fight, so that when the fight is over, the only thing you can say, and all those who are looking on in your life can say is, wow, his God showed up. David goes on, he says it like this, and all this assembly shall know. That the Lord saves not with sword and spear for what? For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. When I teach people to how to quit smoking in the clinic, when I, in a few minutes, we do a pretty powerful stop smoking class at our, the SDA clinic in Guam uh, led by Pastor Torres. But, but sometimes just in the room, I'm trying to get people to stop smoking. And you want to talk about facing a giant? The addiction of nicotine is one of the most powerful physiological giants you could ever face. That's why you should never smoke a cigarette. Ever. Nicotine is as addicting as cocaine. Maybe we'll talk more about that on the stress night. And people will come to you having smoked for 20 years, 30 years, a pack, two packs a day. And I would often do the math with them and show them how much money they're actually losing. There are people who, when, I, when you do the math on when they drink a six pack of beer a night and a, and a pack or two of cigarettes a day and you do the math on how much that costs in a year, and I tell them you could cruise the Mediterranean for two, what you getting lit up with every night. But people often wanna quit, and I, and I don't believe the moral decision is made once you're an addict. The moral decision is made when you become an addict, when you know you shouldn't smoke a cigarette and you smoke it. But once you're an addict, it changes, it's a disease now, and, and it takes supernatural power to break that disease. And when I read about Jesus healing in the Bible, he doesn't go to the leper and say, man, why did you go around a leper and get leprosy in the first place, man? Didn't you know you're supposed to stay away from lepers? Right? Did you ever see Jesus do you know, you know, stop and say, man, why are you blind, man? Couldn't you avoid that stick? <laughs> Jesus deals with the disease because disease is bondage. Sometimes we're so judgmental. That's why a lot of our health ministry stuff doesn't even work. Folk come in there and they feel like, man, I messed up so bad, I might as well go back and have a cigarette. 
But I tell folk, I say, listen, you can gain victory over this thing, and I give them a secret. I say, listen, you need to do two things. You need to go get uh, straws, cut them the length of cigarettes, and pull on a straw. There's a nerve plexus in the back of your throat, and the urge for a cigarette only lasts less than 25, 30 seconds. If you just pull on the straw for a minute, a lot of times the urge for the cigarette will go away, and because that nerve plexus is hit, parts of your brain will think it's getting a cigarette, and the urge will pass, and you cannot have that cigarette. And you'll learn to actually come down off of your demands for cigarettes. The second thing I tell them is to go and get index cards. And I learned this in Loma Linda at the Veterans Hospital where I worked with the uh, U.S. Uh, veterans of war who some spoke two, three, four packs of cigarettes a day. And I learned this in the, teaching that class. You get an index card and you have them write on one side of the card a Bible verse, a Bible promise. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Or, 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 or uh, God, is not, uh, God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Or, or, or if they're not Christian, sometimes they just say, look, I'm not a believer. And you say, okay, use a, a motivation quote, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. So you, you, but I like Bible verse, so I try and get them to do a Bible verse. There's 20 cigarettes in a pack, so I try and have them make up 20 index cards. A Bible verse, a different Bible verse on one side of each one, and on the back side of that card, I want them to write one reason they should quit smoking. And for many of them, I say, do you have a granddaughter? They say, yes. I say, do you want to be alive to see your granddaughter get married? Would you like to be alive to see your grandson do this? Or would you like to be alive to, to do this? And, 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 and they'll say yes, and they, and they write it on the back of the card. And you give them an example. And so a Bible verse with a promise on one side and then a reason to quit smoking on the other side. And it's powerful. And one of the verses I like is this one. The last part of this verse, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And I explained to the, the smoker the giant is your cigarettes, but the battle is the Lord's. Let me tell you, so that's the secret to gaining victory over sin in general. If you fight in your own power, you're going to lose. But when God does the fighting for you, you win. The tenth one of these is this one. Don't let the giant do all the talking. Sometimes you're just hearing, you're just hearing all the chatter of all the fear. You, you know, people tell you, like, you know those cigarette smokers, that people tell them you can't, you'll never quit smoking cigarettes. You're an addict, look how many years you smoked. Folk will tell you, and you'll never, you know, you're never gonna get through college, you'll never finish, you can't. Don't let the problem do all the talking. Let God talk into your problem. In other words, inject Bible promises into your life. You see, what happens when you read the two sides of that card is you move. You see, the act of smoking a cigarette is buried in a part of your brain called the basal ganglia, where your habits are formed. And so it's automatic. It, it just happens. In fact, many smokers will tell you they can pull a cigarette out of the pack and put it in their mouth and light it. Don't even remember actually doing it. It's such, so habitual for them now, so automatic. But when you read the card, the two sides of the card, you move the act from the basal ganglia to the frontal lobe of your brain, back to the frontal cortex of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, right behind your forehead bone here. This is your reasoning center, and a third of the human brain is frontal lobe. The next smartest animal is a porpoise or a chimpanzee. Their frontal lobe is only 13% of their brain. Ours is 33%. Now, don't, don't start looking around the room trying to figure out if it's folk functioning on less than 33%. <laughs> I want you to get this because there's power when you live in the frontal lobe of your brain. I heard Doug Batchelor once talk about the body of the temple and as a doctor I went and I did some research and you can actually literally map out the sanctuary message through the body. And if you do that, the brain, the two-thirds of the brain is the holy place. But don't miss this. The third of the brain at its frontal lobe becomes the most holy place. It is where the Shekinah glory of God falls in your body. And this is where the decisions are made. You see, the great monkey wrench of the universe is choice. Why? Because God can't force you to love him. If he forced you to do it, it would cease to be love. So you have to give everyone choice. And so when people ask you if there's a loving God, why is there bad things that happen in this world? The great, the, the response is choice. 
Because with choice comes consequences. And because God gives a choice, he can't, the consequences have to almost be allowed to happen. It's part of the great controversy. Don't miss this. So in the frontal lobe of your brain is where the great controversy is fought out in your life. It's where the Shekinah glory of God falls. It's where GABA, a chemical, is released in your brain that actually restrains you and helps you to control certain behaviors in your tongue. When you drink alcohol or smoke marijuana, it blocks, uh, it, it inhibits the release of this inhibiting factor called GABA. So your GABA goes low and you speak and talk how you want to when you're inebriated. There's a battle going on right here. That's why there's so many alcohol commercials and that's why they're trying to legalize marijuana because the devil wants to win this part of your brain. So what I'm challenging you to understand is there's power in keeping this part of your brain pure and clean if you're going to face a giant. So you can't let the giant do all the talking. The numbers mess up, but look at the verse. Proverbs 18 and verse 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. What the Bible is saying there is that you can, when you, when, you, when you allow the enemy to tell you and talk to you and make you believe certain things on many levels, it messes with the way that your frontal lobe is supposed to work. But when you speak life into a situation, before you face the challenges of the day, you read a scripture. You, you're going through something at work and you pick up 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let me tell you something. It changes the way you go into that meeting that day at work. Changes the way you sit to take that exam at school. Changes the way you approach hand, handing out a glow track in the hallway of your high school. Because the words themselves have life. Let's wrap it up. Verse 48, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a what? and a stone, and smote the Philistine, and slew him, but there was no sword in his hand. David said, I'm not going to win this thing with, with sword and shield. No sword in his hand. So David ran and took the Philistine's sword, and drew it out of his sheath, and slew him, and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, what did they do? They ran for their lives. When it comes to spiritual warfare, when the, you have to battle and you have to deal with what you have to deal with, young people don't hold back. Go all the way for God. When that giant topples and falls over, stand over that giant and finish him off. And what I mean by that is God is going to, I told you this last night, there's some of you, and I've experienced it over the last couple of years, over the last year, God is going to move you into a position that when the world strikes you or tries to strike you, great truth is going to automatically be illuminated. And some of you, God is going to put you in positions where he's going to be able to use you because this gospel must be preached everywhere. It's one of the reasons why I, I believe you should, you should find out what God wants you to do with your life. Find your purpose. Some of you are called to be accountants. You say, why would anybody be called to be an accountant? Let me tell you, when I go to my accountant's office in California, there's steps to Christ on the, on the table. There's Christian music playing. All of Ellen White's books are laid out. And 90% of their clients, they're Adventists, but 90% of their clients are not Adventists. And you walk in there, and their, their clients are in there reading tracts and reading the books. I, I'm, I'm trying to tell you that some of us have boxed ministry in too small. And what I'm trying to give you this week is that you're called to do great things because God called you. And he will find a place to put you that your light needs to shine. And no one else is being called into that space. So you need to be prepared. Wherefore, where, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I'll finish with this great story about facing your giants. Dr. Martin Luther King 
was preaching at a church at his church in Birmingham. <coughs> and as he was preaching on one night of the week, the, someone ran in the back of the church and came and got him and said, uh, and pulled him off and, and, and the deacons pulled him to the side and Dr. King stopped his sermon, took off, took off, you know, took off from the church and jumped in his car and drove to his house. By the time he got there, a mob, a, 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 a gang of people had f- formed outside of the house. And when he saw, look, that picture is a picture taken from that night. A bomb had been set off on the porch of his house and had blown the front of the house off. His wife and his first child were in the back of the house. Had they been in the front room, they would have been killed. And they were actually, that's where the room the baby normally was, some say. An angry black mob had gathered and, and they had grabbed bottles and stones. In fact, many of them had guns and they were about ready to attack anyone who came who looked like they might have done it. In fact, even when the police showed up, they were about to confront the police and there was about to be a violent riot in the streets in front of Dr. King's house. Dr. King gets there and he looks around. The sheriff grabs him and pulls him. The sheriff was a known member of the Ku Klux Klan. He grabs him and pulls him and tells him, you've got to say something because I'm going to lose men tonight. He wasn't worried about who else might get killed, but he realized that the, uh, the blacks were so mad that they would kill anyone in uniform that night. Sources say that Dr. King stepped onto that blown up porch And he preached one of the best sermons he ever preached. A sermon that basically said in a nutshell, you cannot respond to violence with violence. Spectators say they watched as the angry mob dropped their sticks and their their bottles as the guns went back into their holsters, as they uncocked their shotguns and, 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 and the whole thing calmed down. And as that angry mob dispersed, some of the, of the white officers who hated his guts actually thanked him that night for their lives. On some level, that fight is over. As you see in the States and in, in, in Baltimore recently, in America, we still kind of have some of those fights. That's not our fight necessarily. I'm here to tell you that for some of you, you're going to have a porch bombing kind of experience. And you're going to be challenged with out of the catastrophe, how do you lift up Jesus in the middle of the storm? And what I want you to get tonight is this. If you follow the steps and you're prepared, and the time comes for you to face your giant, you will be able to show the world a glimpse, maybe even more, maybe a good showing of who Jesus is. The challenge, however, is you can't go to face your giant on the spur of a moment. We have these camp meetings because you've got to be preparing right now to face that giant. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to face giants. But Father God, many run when they see the giants, when they see the challenges, when they see the obstacles. But Lord, you give us these stories in the scripture as examples that we need not be afraid. And that the battle is the Lord's. I pray tonight, Lord, as we went through these 10 steps, I pray in a special way that these young people be ready as these last day giants come in front of us and need to be taken down. I pray in a special way tonight for the leadership of this conference, for every church that is represented here, for every family that's represented here, I pray, Father God, that you would remove fear from our lives and replace it with faith. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let all the church say, amen.